a Hindu man, Jamie, Jamie Patel, who is uh, somebody who has been in this profession for many, many years. And as you may know, the Hindu, the Jain, the Buddhist, all these Indian philosophies have a very unique uh, spirituality and philosophy for animals, which is that every living being has a soul, including animals. And therefore, the philosophy of respect for animals is very unique. It's, so what I'm intrigued by is how does a Hindu who, who end a vet come to take his philosophy forward and apply it in the practice of his work. Uh, Britain is an animal loving nation. You know, it's, it's a well known fact that almost animals are a religion of Britain, right? So, but yet uh, Hindus are a religion of India. So, so how does that come, come together? Jamie, can you tell me a little bit? How do, how do you apply the philosophy in the work that you do? Well, it's quite simple because, it's, uh, like you said, you know, the, the compassion is that's that's coming through, mm -hmm. and uh, this is what, and you know, when we are looking at these animals, it's basically looking after their welfare, and if you are not compassionate, you're not, not going to be able to do that, mm -hmm. and this is what we are we are trying to do here, you know, and particularly as a Hindu vet, it, it comes naturally in a sense. Mm -hmm. You're trying to do the best for these animals. These are the ones who have no voice. So, you know, very much like a, like a pediatrician, mm -hmm. they do have uh, the, animal, uh, the children cannot tell them what's wrong, you have to find out. The same here, my patients have, have nothing to say, and we have to help them out, find out what's going on, mm -hmm. and we try and help them out. Wow, so how do you apply your philosophy? Is there something distinctive about the way you care for your animals, the service you provide to the, to the patients and the clients that come here? Uh, because you're, you you're yourself are a very learned Hindu, and you're very, uh, proud about your culture and your identity, so yes, yeah, no, definitely. I mean, I, I wouldn't say there's anything particularly different in the sense that uh, I think most vets who go into the profession are possibly, you know, way although they are not termed Hindus, are probably in a sense Hindus because that's the, they've got this compassion about the animals. Yeah. Uh, particularly, I find it, you know, we if you go back to the Upanishads, you know, you have uh, slokes there, you know, punctures which say, you know. The look up, you know, may all be well, may all have, you know, prosper, that sort of thing. So when you say all, it embraces to me all beings, not necessarily just humans, not necessarily a certain community or creed or race, but it's all beings. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that, that includes the animals. I mean, in practice, uh, Indians and Hindus and Jains generally don't tend to have pets. Pets is not a part of their tradition. That's correct, yeah. You know, I think it's, it's not, it hasn't been in a sense. Uh, but uh, we're getting the new generation who are born and brought up in the UK mm -hmm. and we can see it, you know, when I started uh, you know, some, some uh, 15, 20 years ago the, you did not have so many Indians with animals mm -hmm. but now the new generation who have been brought and bred, bred in the UK mm -hmm. they, this is part of their culture and they do have it and it's so important that they have that, the, the sort of philosophy background mm -hmm. which helps them you know, look after this animal. Mm -hmm. You say about the culture, I mean, you know, it's obviously a part of British culture to have animals, but do you think that as a people, uh, British people impose their religion and their beliefs onto the animals that they own? Is, is there, do they actually own the animals? Do they? Yeah, I think the, I don't think we, anybody owns the animals particularly. They, I think everybody's a custodian. And that's the way I look at it, that all these clients who come to me with their pets, they are custodians of these animals. And it's my job equally mm -hmm. to help them. I mean, I, possibly I'm part of the extended family, mm -hmm. to, you know, as a custodian, to look after their welfare. So, yes, I don't think anybody really owns. How can you own another being, really? You are just a custodian. Like we are custodians of this earth, you know. Yeah, but I, the, the reality I see is that uh, people actually do impose their, their beliefs onto the animals and they do act as if they own them and some of them, it's quite obvious that they actually try to control the animal and try to... Yes, I think that that, that comes off, I mean, because you know, they are, in, in a legal sense, they are considered property. But I think when you come down, when you're talking about that sort of uh, spiritual level, you can't own this. And you're quite right, people do impose their values on it, which is wrong, mm. because you shouldn't, you know, after all it should, you know, what's my dharma is not necessarily the animal's dharma, mm -hmm. uh, their dharma, you know, every individual being has got their own dharmic uh, direction to take in a sense. Mm -hmm. My dharma may be to be vegetarian, mm -hmm. and I cannot impose that on an animal, 
mm. who is a carnivore. Mm. So for example, cats are carnivores, they cannot survive as vegetarians. Mm -hmm. Now you do find people who have, for some reason, adopted vegetarianism, want to impose that onto cats. Mm -hmm. And that's wrong because the cat will not survive as a vegetarian. Mm -hmm. So that's important. I think as a custodian, mm -hmm. I should look after the welfare of the animal mm -hmm. by allowing it to follow its own dharma. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have seen pets being seen as company, as entertainment, as, a, as almost like a fashion aspect or something to be proud about. I mean, there are many ways in which people extend their own egos onto animals, you know. Yes, and that is such a problem now, you know, I think uh, because pe people do that, it's a fad mm -hmm. to have certain types of animals, and that's wrong. Mm -hmm. Yes, companionship from animals is fine, uh, you know, I mean, we know even from our scriptures, when you look at the Mahabharata, mm -hmm. in the last final stages when the Pandavas went up to the Himalayas, mm -hmm. it was the five, it was the Pandavas, Draupadi uh, and the dog, mm -hmm. and it was companionship. Mm -hmm. So even right to the end, you know, they say that we will not leave the dog behind. The same, I think, here, companionship is fine, but to have it as a fashion item, that's wrong. Mm -hmm. Because that's when welfare starts being affected. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, e even with companionship, is there like, okay, is the relationship a one-way relationship or a two-way relationship? No, it's definitely two-way. You know, I think we are in, in one of the countries where basically that is, uh, <coughs> it's, it's a very, very good and very well known out there. You know, admittedly, there are a few cases where things do go wrong, but uh, it is a two-way. They, they do, they know, I mean, by and large, my clients here, they do look after their animals so very well. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, that's when something goes wrong, they come to us. And mm -hmm. that in itself shows they are caring people. Mm -hmm. Okay. How do you extend your whole philosophy to the whole kind of animal industry? You know, like the, 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 the dairy industry, the meat industry, and uh, that area of work. Uh, yeah, I mean that is that is always difficult. We are my main work involves small animals, so basically house pets and things like that. So it's mainly from the companion uh, animal side of things. Mm -hmm. For for the others, it's a very difficult one, and you know it's 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 some next ongoing debate again even within the veterinary profession. You know about slaughtering animals and you know how do you look after them and how are you compromising their welfare. It's a constant battle and constant ongoing. Things change, ideas change, and it's all at least. You know, there, there are a set of people where, yes, it, you know, um, the, the slaughtering and the abattoirs and the meat is part of the diet, and that will happen. But at least the welfare, while the animals are being looked after, mm. as long as that has been taken care of, it, it's a step, step mm. in the right direction. But, but that whole aspect of ownership is, is quite a critical difference, really. I mean, you know, you say that in the law, animals are property. But also, you could say in Christianity, animals are property. You know that there is this feeling that people do feel that they own the animal. Well, I mean, <coughs> that's always a thing, isn't it, with the human race? There's uh, always the, the the idea of being in power, mm -hmm. and so you know, if we we have got the the intellect to to rule over mm -hmm. some some things, or lower intellect, then we do that. Mm -hmm. But uh, yes, it, it is it is a problem, mm -hmm. and it's 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 an ongoing battle. You know, I mean, I think we are probably in the minority, if not only in the UK, but if you look in the whole world, where the idea of vegetarianism is, we are, what, 1% or less? Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's a complicated struggle. From a scientific point of view, and you're trained as a scientist, how can you prove that an animal has, so, has soul or spirit? Ha! Huh. That's a difficult one, isn't it? But I think all sentient beings, I mean, again, they, they, here is a... Uh, Yes, is a little animal that's been born. Okay. Right. Yeah, and so you know when you do, it goes through life stage, and we have got an idea at the end of it. It's you know that life finishes, and so you're thinking well when you bring in a philosophy, you're thinking well lots of things like incarnation and things like that. But have they got soul? Yes. They have got feelings. Yes. I think. This is pain. Yeah, and then there is yes the, the discomfort because if they have feelings, not only the sense of uh, separation from the owner. Uh, as because we, that's how we are conceiving these people as owners, not as custodians. We must have separation from that, but also pain when they are hurt. Mm. There is there is discomfort, mm. and I'm, yes, they, I, I believe that they do all have souls. 
What do you think as a Hindu and a vet about the charities which do work uh, in the area of animal welfare, like the RSPCA? What do you think of the work of the RSPCA? I think it's very commendable. You know, RSPCA has done so much for welfare in this country mm -hmm. and, you know, possibly instrumental in pushing for the uh, Animal Welfare Act of 2006, which is actually putting responsibility on people mm -hmm. to, once you take an animal or it's in your care, you have to legally look after it, mm -hmm. make sure it's fed, watered, it's got uh, uh, environment which is suitable for it. Those are initially the just essential criteria for the survival of that uh, animal. Mm -hmm. So I think they've done very well to, to get those things going. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, anything else you want to add? No, I, th I, think, I think it is wonderful that you know, we, we've got a lot of uh, people in, in the UK who are actually um, promoting the welfare of animals as well. It's, you know, hopefully, you know, we'll get more, more and more people doing that, you know. The newer generation of uh, British Hindus mm. definitely are, are embracing that. Mm -hmm. I mean, here's a question which uh, you may, uh, uh, I'd love your answer, to hear your answer on. I, I actually feel that because Britain is a secular society, they, and, and because every human being wants to believe in something, that belief has been converted in the direction of animals. You know, so animals are actually a religion in Britain. Uh, and actually, if you then add the dimension of animals as having soul, then we can have a country where actually spirituality and respect for each and every living being can be extended so that people can actually feel that just as we love our animals, we should love other people too and respect them. Yes, I think so. But I mean, perhaps what's happened in what we are seeing where the animals have become an integral part of the British way of life, mm -hmm. uh, has it been that because we have, where we come from, our background, say for example in India, you have the extended family and that, that fabric we do not see a lot of in this country. And so then that companionship has been passed on to the animals. So perhaps things will go a full circle. Yeah, so effectively what you are actually saying, the Masala tour is showing that Indians have an instinct to build communities wherever they go and they, they always have strong family values and extended families etc. And here because of the breakdown of community uh, in the wider society in Britain, you have an increase in animal ownership and, uh, you know, uh, and pet ownership. Uh, and uh, actually the way to sort of bridge the, the gap and build community cohesion is to bring that wider communitarian culture and family culture into British society. Yes, yeah, and I think it would be great to have that wider sort of uh, family values mm -hmm. as well as you know, the animal welfare aspect of it together. Mm -hmm. I think that would be brilliant. Ah, so you're talking about fusion. Absolutely. And we can all learn from one another. Absolutely. Because, I mean, when, you, when you look at it, if you look at back in India, you know, you do not have the same welfare mm. imposed on animals. Mm. And, you know, so they are, they are third class citizens in a sense. Mm. And well, why not? We, do, you know, we can have those values from India mm. and eat years. I think that would be brilliant culture.